Hey, how's it going? Last week we put Garchomp in red and blue and we did an experiment to see how it would do. You can watch that video if you want an idea of how I did that, but it went great and we are back at it again this week. So since it's the spookiest time of the year, I think it's time for the one, the only, the banished to the distortion world, Dark Lord Garatina. Now on paper, Garatina looks to be an absolute monster. Ghost typing is borderline overpowered in Generation 1, and combined with its dragon typing, it means that it just resists most of the trainers in the entire game. But things don't always translate in practice. What things could actually be wrong with Garatina? Well my friends, we'll get into why in today's video. But first, I'd quickly like to say that if you enjoy this content, feel free to help out the channel by hitting the subscribe button and the bell to be notified of my uploads, likes, even dislikes go a long way in the algorithm, as well as comments. Even if you could care less, just comment carrot and it'll get my video recommended to more people. So with that out of the way, let's just dive into it and we'll see how Garatina does in Kanto. So just like with Garchomp, it's a lot harder to reset for DVs because it's a lot harder to calculate for. I don't worry about it too much because this is a ROM hack version, this is a fun run, but let's take a look at the sprite work for Garatina. It's not too bad, I actually kind of like it, but I definitely wouldn't say it's my favorite out of all the ones that I've seen. I then nicknamed Garatina the only viable name, which is obviously gonna be Tina. And before Tina and I go on our journey, let's talk about this back sprite. It's not great. If I had to think of a word to describe it, I'd go with penisy. It's very phallic, very penis-like. I do not do minimum battles up to Brock. And let's go over why real quick and get into some of Tina's early game problems. The red and blue version of it only starts out with tackle, so that's problem number one. And you might be sitting there thinking, well tackle isn't great, but since you're ghost type, you shouldn't be able to take any damage from Brock outside of maybe some bad damage from Onyx. But to that, I say not so fast, Buckarino. The second problem is that this isn't your grandmom and grandpop's Brock fight. This version updates some moves and adds typings, so that means that Onyx has some new moves. First off, it has Harden. It means that it makes both tackle and eventually struggle do pathetic damage. The real problematic addition is that now it has rock throw. These two combined means that this fight is not only ridiculously long, but it's borderline impossible. So I'm forced to grind. Legendaries being in the slow leveling group means that this is not fast and it's not good if you want to have those elite sub 3 hour times, but you gotta do what you gotta do. So at that point I return and I face the optional rival fight and I exhaust whatever trainers I have left and then I fight some Kakunas and then we eventually hit level 10. This makes the fight possible on the very first attempt at this level. Geodude is a huge slog but it's relatively the same as the vanilla version but even in this battle I get down to a measly 6 HP. This is not a fun fight and having to struggle down on a powerful legendary, it just doesn't feel good at all. And you might be thinking that it gets much better after the awful Brock fight, but you'd be wrong. And in an effort to save time, I really stretch tackle to its maximum limits as I make my way through Mount Moon. And this leads us to the super nerd guarding the fossils. This NPC that I've never had a single problem on ended up being a huge roadblock for the almighty Garatina. And at this point, I've been on struggle strats for a while, and the problem here is that Sonic Boom does 20 hit points of topless damage every time that it's used from this Voltorb. And there's lots of double knockouts, I fail a decent amount, and I simply cannot afford to go back and grind up anymore, so I have to keep attempting this fight several times before I can progress. And at this point, I'm not feeling too great about Garatina. These ROM hack runs have an element of blindness in them in terms of maybe the new things added on top of the fact that I don't know the TMs that they can learn or the level up learn sets of the Pokemon that I'm using and I'm just kind of dumbfounded. I'm kind of wondering when this is going to pick up. Eventually I do get the luck required where Voltorb doesn't do multiple sonic booms and I make it past and we can breathe a sigh of relief as we head towards Cerulean City. Brighter days are ahead because at the end of this fight we do learn Slash which is a 100% critical hit move with Garatina's speed and it's a massive upgrade from Tackle. It's not the best move in the world, but when you are the Dark Lord running around with Tackle, struggling on Super Nerds, you really just take what you can get, guys. 
This takes us to rival number two, and Slash is a huge upgrade as you would expect. Unfortunately, I do fail to one hit the Pidgeotto, I take a sand attack as a result, but it turns out to not really matter. After that is Nugget Bridge and the route up to Bill's house, and it's simple enough, and now it's time to face Misty after that. This battle isn't too interesting, Slash does heavy damage, and even with the Starmie knowing Hydro Pump, Garatina barely takes any damage. The interesting bit of this fight is that at level 19, Garatina learns Shadow Sneak and generates. 1, damaging ghost moves are limited to only lick, and shadow sneak being an increased priority move like quick attack, it's pretty intriguing. There are two important things to take note of. The first is remembering that ghost moves are physical attacks in generation 1, and the second is that normally ghost moves can affect psychic in generation 1 due to a coding bug, but in this ROM hack, it's fixed. Moving on to the SSN, I do waste a slight bit of time getting the rare candy before heading to rival number 3. Both the Pidgeotto and the Raticate are able to survive my moves, but we do get to see Shadow Sneak in action, and it feels pretty satisfying to demolish this Kadabra here. Charmeleon has Dragon Rage, and it gets us worryingly low, but I still get this done in one shot. Now after getting cut, it's time for a Lieutenant Surge. Just like with Misty, the elemental toppings just don't do a lot to Garatina's dragon topping. I do get paralyzed by the Pikachu, but overall it's another easy fight, and it seems to only be getting easier for good old Tina after a rough start, especially now that we have access to Thunderbolt, which is one of the best coverage moves there is for Pokemon that have good special. After that, there's a bit of a lull during the rock tunnel portion, so let's pick up after that. In Celadon, I grab the water for the Saffron Guards, and unfortunately Garatina cannot learn Rock Slide or Ice Beam. I do get Fly, and I head to get Psychic, which is THE move in Generation 1, and thankfully Tina can learn that. Now it's time for the Rocket Hideout, and that leads us to Giovanni. You might be surprised about this, but this was one of the harder fights in the game. All of his Pokemon were simple enough to get past, but this goddamn Kangaskhan was a menace, an absolute menace. The baby was yelling at me, everything was getting confusing, and we just kept getting put down. The one thing I appreciate about this ROM hack is the unpredictability of the updated movesets, and the chip damage that we take along the way combined with Kangaskhan knowing a now dark top move in Bite absolutely ruins us. It takes me 5 times to get past this fight, and the final time I actually get bailed out by Giovanni using a guard spec, and even then I barely survived the battle with a measly 7 HP. Now I'm hoping that this is just an anomaly, and the run stays smooth sailing so we can make up for some lost time. At the end of the battle, I do get the chance to learn Dragon Claw, but I opt against it because Slash at this point just does better at dealing with those minor trainers and we'll replace it anyway. Next up I go ahead and I take care of Erica, and we know the drill. Basic elemental types against Dragon combined with having Psyche against the two half poison types makes this one of the easier battles. The only thing interesting is that although Bind doesn't affect me from Tangela, I still get the continues this attack message, and this is another easy win overall. Now we are moving on to Pokemon Tower, and that means rival number 4. Garatina has an easy answer for all of his Pokemon. Thunderbolt easily murders Gyarados and Pidgeotto. Shadow Sneak melts, Execute, and Kadabra as well. And I don't have a super effective answer for Charmeleon just yet, but Slash does the job just fine. I finish up, I get the Poke Flute, and we're moving on. Afterwards, it's time for a brisk walk to Fuchsia, and for once, the psychic top trainers in the gym are a cakewalk with Shadow Sneak, and that brings us to Koga. Just like with Gengar and Ghastly, this fight is really easy. We have access to Psychic, along with the ghost typing nullifying any potential Weezing self-destruct shenanigans. Everything is just as easy as it sounds. Weezing even makes this a little bit faster by just killing itself. I pick up the final HMs from Safari Zone, and now it's time for everyone's favorite company, Silphco, corporations rule. Unfortunately, Giratina cannot learn Swords Dance, but it can learn Earthquake, so that's a plus for later in the game. Anyways, now it's time for rival number 5, and this would be a good test to see how far Tina has come since struggling on Brock. And the answer is, it's came really far. Thunderbolt takes out the Pidgeot in a single hit, Shadow Sneak can deal with the Execute, but it's still pretty annoying, it gets a confused proc off of Confusion, and then Gyarados as always hates Thunderbolt because it's got a double weakness to it. And here, I can say that one hitting the Alakazam always feels very satisfying. Shadow Sneak is tailor made to absolutely murder this spoon cat. It's physical and it's super effective. Now, last up, the rival finally evolved as Charmeleon, and now it's actually weak to Thunderbolt as well. And this is one of the easier rival number five fights I've had in all of my runs, and that has me going pretty optimistic for the rest of this run. Next up is Giovanni. 
And this doesn't go great, but I am able to get it done on the first time. Psychic is a huge help as you would imagine, but Kangaskhan with Bite still does heavy damage. I get really low overall, but I can't stress enough how much of a monster Garatina's stats are. This thing is an absolute tank, and the higher level we get, the more stats we get, the better it gets. The next gem is Sabrina, and as much problems with Psychic types as we've had in the past in our other runs, it feels great to see how this one plays out. Uh, she has 4 Pokemon, I use 4 moves, and that's all it takes. Shadow Sneak on the Kadabra, Shadow Sneak on the Mr. Mime, Psychic on the Venomoth, and a single Shadow Sneak on the Alakazam gets us through this gym. It was... this has to be the easiest fight in the game. I don't think there's another gym where we just one-shot every Pokemon, so that feels really good. And after that, we surf on down to Cinnabar, and that brings us to everyone's favorite question of the day. Tombstoner, brother! Now it's time for Blaine. As previously mentioned, Garatina learns Earthquake, and I utilize it to make this fight fairly trivial. There's not much to say about this one other than that Arcanine can survive an Earthquake, but it goes down the next turn, and that's it. I keep the momentum going straight to the last gem. This time, Giovanni does not have Kangaskhan anymore, so this fight is significantly easier. I'm running low on Earthquake PP. I have not healed since the last fight, but I do get several critical hits, and that helps out. That, along with Psychic, makes this a fairly easy fight, and I'm pleased with how the latter part of the game has turned out after that rough start. Now with all the gems down, it's time for a good litmus test with rival number 6 to see sort of how this last few fights of the game are going to go. And just like with the 5th rival fight, Tina has a great toolkit to deal with what is usually a troublesome battle. Thunderbolt can decimate the Pidgeot, Shadow Sneak handles the Execute fairly well, and at level 42 I do replace Shadow Sneak with Shadow Claw. It's a little bit stronger, and Tina is fast enough to not really need the priority move in most situations. Gyarados and Thunderbolt is self-explanatory, it never gets old, done. Now on to the Alakazam. The sentence I just said about not needing priority moves for Shadow Sneak is wrong since I'm outsped, but it just goes for a reflex so it doesn't really matter. Shadow Claw does the job just the same though. Charizard is last, and while Dragon Rage can be annoying, it's not enough to get past the super effective Thunderbolt. Just like with some of our previous slow leveling group runs, notice that we are out leveled by 11 levels in this last fight. Now after swiftly making our way through Victory Road, I saved the game at 3 hours and 2 minutes heading into the Elite Four. It's not a bad time by any stretch of the imagination, but we're looking to be about 30 minutes off of an elite level time. So at level 44, I attempt to see how tough Lorelei will actually be, and with our level disadvantage not using any candies yet, the answer is not great. Dugon gets off a big super effective hit, and even though we weave our way through this fight and make it all the way to Lapras, Blizzard takes us out, we're not even close. So at this point, we have to use rare candies, and that's expected. I only use 6 of them because if Tina can't get the highest time, maybe we can get the lowest level as some compensation. And at level 50, this is how different the lore life fight goes. Thunderbolt one hits Dugong, Thunderbolt also one shots Cloyster, a Shadow Claw crit one taps the Slowbro, a follow up Shadow Claw then takes out the Jinx in one hit, and then Thunderbolt does not one hit the Lapras, but it does miss the Blizzard. I don't think it would have one shot me at full health barring a lucky crit from Lapras, but the world may never know. Great stats plus a good move pool makes this fight much easier, and who knew that battles are much easier when you're close to your opponent's level. Next up is Bruno, and be serious with me for a minute. What do you expect me to say, or how do you expect this fight to go? I have the Lord of the Shadow Dimension with excellent typing, stats, I got Psychic, I got Earthquake, versus the worst trainer to ever lace up his boots. It's a figure of speech because Bruno doesn't even wear shoes or a shirt because he's a degenerate. But can I get a fuck Bruno in the chat if you hate Bruno as much as me? Moving on. Next up is Agatha, and although Tina has the tools to do heavy, super effective damage to every Pokemon, this fight gave me some trouble. The first failure I had, the final Gengar fainted me with Shadow Ball, since that's a new move that it knows with the ROM hat. The second attempt, the first Gengar actually has Dark Pulse, and it deals heavy, super effective damage and makes to fight an uphill battle at that point. The last Gengar can just do whatever it wants, but it turns out that it has Dark Pulse as well. The final successful Agatha attempt was still a nail biter. I'm able to do super effective damage without taking any in return throughout the first Pokemon, and then the last Gengar outspeeds us, gets off a Shadow Ball, and does heavy super effective damage to take us down to 29 HP. Luckily, a super effective Earthquake takes it out in one hit, and overall this fight wasn't too bad. 
and we did have some candies if we needed them, but I'm still on pace to finish at the lowest level that I've ever had in Solar Run, so that's good. Next up is Lance, and if this was your mom and dad's Pokemon Red, would be in the clear, but new movesets and updated types make this one about as bad as Agatha. Gyarados isn't worth mentioning ever, Thunderbolt sends it to the Shadow Realm, and that's just a consistent fact. The first problem with these updates is Dragon Breath chipping us down. Both of the Dragonairs and the Dragonite have it. The really big problem is that Aerodactyl has Crunch, now a Dark Top. The first defeat I get chipped down, I get crunched, and after Dragonite gets a Hyper Potion, I'm in too much of a hole to really come back or survive. The second time I get critically hit with a Crunch and that's that. The third time is just like the first, I get into a health deficit early and then Dragonite gets a Hyper Potion and I just can't outpace the Dragon Rage damage. And finally, the last time I make it to the Dragonite, I get a critical hit Thunderbolt to take the Dragonite down. And who can say if a non-crit would have triggered a Hyper Potion, but at 55 health I could have survived a couple of more turns, so it may have not mattered. Either way, this battle's over, and it's time for the champion battle. Rival number 5 and number 6 were easy fights. Tina had the tools in its toolbox, so how does this one go? And the answer is about the same. Thunderbolt dispatches the Pidgeot in one hit, Alakazam does outspeed us, it gets off some Sabine chip damage, but a Shadow Claw knocks its head off and we're moving on. Rhydon can tank an Earthquake, but it doesn't do much damage in return, and the second Earthquake takes us on to the next. And we've been over Executor in the Ghastly and Gengar videos, it's about the same here. Hypnosis is annoying, but it can't damage us with its normal type moves. Luckily, we do just get a crit on the Shadow Claw, and we save a lot of time here. Gyarados is next, and I don't want to be a broken record, Thunderbolt. You know the age-old story by this point. Finally, Charizard is up last, and it takes a couple of Thunderbolts to take it down. In return, I do take some wing attack damage, and although we get a little bit low, it's not low enough, and Garatina finishes off the Elite Four, and ends the run on a pretty positive note. And that's it. So what do we think of Garatina? In short, not very good. Despite having all the potential to be one of the very best, it's bogged down by poor starting moves on the part of the person who did the ROM hack. Tina finishes with a time of 3 hours and 16 minutes, and that's only a single minute ahead of Ghastly. The lone caveat here is that Garatina can cling on to having the privilege of being the lowest level so far to complete the game in these runs at level 55, so at least we have that consolation prize for good old Tina. And I won't dwell too long on this, but just like with Garchomp, there's really no reason that Garatina shouldn't have started out with Dragon Breath instead of having Tackle, which isn't even in the moveset. Uh, Dragon Breath, maybe Ominous Wind, Ancient Power, those could have all been enough to make the early game not a time-wasting slog. At the end of the day, Garatina was held back by an awful move selection from outside sources, but was still able to bring it back and at least have a respectable time, so I'm happy for that at least. It was a pretty fun run, but I want to keep it real with you guys. I'm a little bored of these ROM hack runs, so I don't think I'll be doing Dialga or Palkia unless something magical happens where this video randomly gets 10,000 views or I get some huge huge outpour of support, which is highly doubtful. More than likely we'll be making our return to the vanilla solo runs, back to those pre-evolved Pokemon, and I have some ideas in mind, probably let's say Charmander, Rhyhorn, Psyduck, uh, those are on my radar at the moment. Rhyhorn and Psyduck have been requested, uh, Charmanders just for me to prove a couple of people I had some arguments about with Growlithe, but we won't get into that right now, maybe later. Anyways, that's about it for me, I uh, hope you enjoyed the video, and I guess I'll catch you guys on the next one. Bye!